The, chair, the Subcommittee on Energy and Environment will come to order. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing entitled An Examination of DOE's Clean Technology Programs. In front of you are packets uh, containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witness panel. I'm now going to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I uh, first want to thank our witnesses for being here today to testify on the DOE's Clean Technology Programs. I appreciate you taking your time from busy schedules to appear uh, before us this afternoon. But before discussing the substance of today's hearings, I'd like to take a moment to note my displeasure with the DOE's lack of responsiveness to this committee. Following Secretary Chu's March appearance before the committee on DOE's 2012 budget request, members submitted written questions to be answered for the hearing record. The questions were sent to DOE on March 18th, three months ago, but the committee has yet to receive a response. Similarly, on May 4th, I sent a letter to Secretary Chu requesting information on many of the programs we're here today to examine. Once more, DOE has yet to respond to my letter, almost a month past the requested response date. The Department's inability to answer fundamental and straightforward questions about programs for which it is requesting billions of dollars not only reflects poorly on the Department, but it hinders congressional oversight and informed budget and policy decision making. The offices represented today are, ex are an excellent case in point. The President is requesting almost two billion dollars in new spending for them. I'd suggest uh, that to DOE that if getting this new money is truly a de departmental priority, responding to com Congress in a timely fashion should be a priority as well. The budget and policy context in which we consider DOE's clean technology programs today is clear and sobering. The United States is currently facing a budget deficit of 1.6 trillion, with a T, dollars, for the current fiscal year, and our government is borrowing more than 40 cents for every dollar we spend. Budget projections for the next decade and beyond bleed red ink. Yet in spite of this dire fiscal reality, President Obama is requesting massive spending to the tune of $8 billion for, quote, clean energy technologies. This request comes on the heels of a 60 percent increase in EERE's base budget over the last six years, over $16 billion worth of stimulus spending provided to EERE alone. While we have only begun to review this spending in detail, indications of wasteful, duplicative, and inappropriate spending may abound and are a cause for great concern. At a more fundamental level, I believe the growing attention to and importance of energy policy warrants more careful consideration of the appropriate role of government in energy technology development. While there is broad agreement that economically feasible alternative energy would be of great benefit to the country, the federal government's increasing tendency to involve itself in the energy marketplace is troubling and may even be ultimately counterproductive. America grows by unleashing its entrepreneurial spirit, motivated by the rewards of success, not through the government picking winners and losers and allocating capital through politically driven policies and programs. The U.S. economy thrives on innovation and a free market. And I look forward to hearing from witnesses today how DOE can better help unleash this innovation by complementing, not supplanting, private efforts. In May, the economy experienced another month of anemic growth and the unemployment rate remains above 9 percent. It may be counterintuitive to the Washington mindset, but the best way to put America back to work may be to get the government out of the way of the private sector. I believe this applies to energy specifically as well as it does generally to the overall economy. Thank you again for your time, and I now recognize Mr. Miller for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. I appreciate uh, Chairman Harris calling today's hearing to examine the administration's clean technology programs. Unfortunately, at a time when the United States needs comprehensive energy policies, the administration and the American people are getting mixed messages from Congress about our visions for energy in the future. There is a growing and unnecessary divide on uh, both the potential for clean energy technologies and the appropriate role of government where winners are supposed to be decided largely by the free market. I, I say that winners are decided largely by the marketplace because energy markets are really anything but free. Uh, the sector has always been heavily regulated and heavily subsidized by governments, and in many cases prices are controlled by cartels and manipulated by complex 
financial mechanisms, I think we'll be discussing that this week on the floor, uh, that have little relation to simple supply and demand. Uh, classic economic models are insufficient for reflecting the complexities of the energy marketplace. At best, consumer choice is often limited to turning down the thermostat or buying a more fuel-efficient car. The sooner we can get beyond the fallacy of free market forces alone, uh, uh, can, can, uh, that, that free, more, free market forces alone can or will determine which technologies are best for the public, the sooner we can make a productive, we can have a productive discussion about how to ensure an environmentally and economically sustainable energy future. There, that is the ultimate goal. Uh, of what is expected of us as leaders. We are not expected to block the progress of innovation for the sake of standing guard over outdated economic doctrine. Uh, our global competitors are more than happy to let us quibble over picking winners and losers while we sit back assuming the United States will ultimately prevail in the, in the global free marketplace that we created. They are busy uh, playing an entirely different game. Other governments are very aggressively investing in high technology and clean energy sectors uh, with enough money to ensure that even their weakest players can beat the United States in those new markets. Uh, that is reason enough to add a few new plays to our playbook. Uh, the program that we are discussing today are innovative government approaches to this problem. D despite the usual rhetoric uh, surrounding energy R&D programs, the government actually seldom picks winners or losers. Um, instead, we place bets on groundbreaking uh, science, promising technologies, talented researchers, and pioneering companies, uh, all for the purpose of promoting a more diverse and competitive marketplace where cleaner and more efficient technologies stand a chance. Uh, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, and often the benefits are unforeseen uh, or simply go unrecognized. Uh, but that is what we, the government, are supposed to do in R&D programs. From basic research on nanoscience materials to loan guarantees for deployment of whole systems, uh, the role of government should be to take on technological and financial risks that, that industry and academia alone are not equipped or inclined to do. We cannot guarantee the, su the success of any project uh, or completely protect against failure. If we could do either, the private sector should do it. Uh, so we cast a wide net, net uh, invest in a range of technologies and projects, manage risk, accept uh, that some disappointment and failures are expected uh, and necessary, hope for breakthroughs, and then translate scientific discoveries into practical solutions. Uh, the programs today represent different variations on that model, but the end, end goal is the same. Uh, it is a shame that increased energy efficiency of the nation and diversifying our energy supply has become so politicized. Uh, some in Congress would like to paint the complex world of renewable energy with a single brushstroke and make the public believe that it's all a big farce. They want the American people to believe it's a zero-sum zero game, uh, conventional industry, uh, energy versus clean energy, uh, with the latter providing, uh, paving a path to economic ruin. Uh, we hear them say that uh, renewable energy technologies are a waste of taxpayer money because they're not financially viable without government support while at the same time arguing uh, that those technologies are too mature or warrant government, uh, to warrant government R&D funding and are better left to the private sector. Well, which is it? Uh, stranger still, uh, as my Republican colleagues lobbied to make massive cuts or shut down DOE clean energy programs altogether, they failed to acknowledge that our own long-standing efforts to subsidize uh, they, they failed to acknowledge their own long-standing efforts to subsidize through tax incentives, R&D programs, liability identification, and other means, the oil, gas, nuclear, and coal sectors, some of the most mature and profitable industries in the world. The subsidies for that industry to develop technologies uh, appears to be a economically and politically powerful industry using their clout uh, to have taxpayers simply pick up some of their ordinary business expenses. Uh, the appropriateness of continued taxpayer support of those sec uh, sectors may be best left to another conversation, but I am highlighting the inconsistency in my colleagues' concerns over interfering in the free market by picking winners and losers and, uh, and appealing for some even-handedness when determined which sectors are deserving of, in uh, deserving of increasingly scarce federal resources. Uh, in closing, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for your attention to this uh, project. Uh, in contrast to just a few years ago, there's an unfortunate and growing divide on clean energy with partisan politics clouding our, our judgment 
uh, on what is the best way for our future. Uh, I believe that in the future we all see that a diverse and clean energy portfolio is worth the investment, and luckily we have made a down payment through programs like ARPA-E, EERE, and, loan, and the Loan Guarantee Program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our witness panel. Uh, Dr. Aaron Majumdar, is that okay? Is that all right? <laughs> is the director for the DOE's Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency Energy, ARPA-E, office. Prior to joining ARPA-E, Dr. Majumdar was the Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Environment at Lawrence Berkeley <laughs> National Laboratory and a professor of mechanical engineering and materials science and engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, in 1985, and his Ph.D. from Berkeley in 1989. Dr. Henry Kel Kelly is the acting assistant secretary for the Department of Energy's Office for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE. Prior to his arrival at DOE, Dr. Kelly served as the president of the Federation of American Scientists. Dr. Kelly previously worked in the Clinton White House as the Assistant Director for Technology for the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He has a Ph.D. in Physics from Harvard University, I'm impressed, <laughs> and a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Cornell University. Mr. David France serves as the Director of the Department of Energy's Loan Guarantee Program, overseeing application review, due diligence, negotiation, environmental compliance, and performance tracking. Prior to working at the DOE, Mr. Franz worked with Overseas Private Investment Corporation as well as with Advanced Capital Markets, a Washington, D.C.-based investment banking firm specializing in international project and corporate finance. Mr. Franz earned two master's degrees in international economics and international business, respectively, from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He received a Bachelor of Arts and a commission in the U.S. Navy from uh, VMI. Mr. Franz also completed postgraduate work at the Harvard Business School. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first uh, witness, Dr. Arun Majumdar, Director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, ARPA-E, at the Department of Energy. Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to extend my thanks to the Chairman, the Ranking Member, and the esteemed members of this subcommittee for inviting me here today to testify on behalf of ARPA-E about our R&D activities. As I've said before to many of you, I consider you all to be my board of directors, and I'm now here to report to you, my board, what we have done in the past and what we plan to do in the future. I'm going to start today on a historical note. RPE was created by this committee and is modeled after DARPA, which was launched in 1958 in response to the launch of Sputnik when it was felt that the United States was losing its technological lead to the Soviets, and we needed some quantum leaps in technology. In the next 30 years, DARPA helped catalyze innovations such as the Internet, GPS, stealth-type technology, and many others. This has strengthened not only our national security, but also our economic prosperity. We are now in a similar critical Sputnik-like moment. We are falling behind in the global race of clean and sustainable energy solutions. We import more than 50 percent of the oil we use while, we, while sending over a billion dollars a day overseas. Our gasoline prices rise because of instabilities around the world. This, in the long term, is not sustainable. Our children and grandchildren's secure future is at stake. And the secure future is like a stool with three legs, national security, economic security, and environmental security. At the foundation of all three securities are innovations in energy technology. RP's goal is very simple, catalyze energy technology innovations for a secure American future. In a short existence of just over two years, what have we done so far? We have stood up an organization with a philosophy of excellence in everything we do. I would now like to share with you five core values and some early successes. Number one, people. Recruit the best talent possible. We have recruited some of the best and the brightest from the technical community. Our program directors stay for a maximum of three years, and then they have to leave. This is not a permanent job. Their future career depends on how they perform at RPE, and they have a three-year clock ticking. This has led to an incredible focus on outcomes. Number two, speed and efficiency. To be globally competitive, speed is of essence. We have developed a streamlined process where we can execute with a fierce sense of urgency an unprecedented speed and efficiency. We have reduced the contracting time to two months and taken other step, steps that have led us to being called the urgency agency. 
Number three, breakthrough technologies through competition. RPE is focused on identifying opportunities for new energy technologies that are too risky for the private sector. Let me give you an example. We created a program to innovate future batteries that would give electric cars longer range and make them cheaper than gasoline-based cars so that electric cars could sell without subsidies. This battery does not exist today. Under this program, we announced ambitious targets for cost and performance, but we are agnostic on the technology. There are now 15 different teams translating science into 15 different competitive technologies. We create the competition and will let the market pick the winners. If one of these batteries is successful, it will make today's lithium-ion batteries obsolete and ensure U.S. technological lead. Number four, stewardship and integrity. Be the best possible stewards of the taxpayer dollars. All projects in RPE are selected purely based on merit and input from a panel of experts. Once selected, our program directors are personally invested in each and every project they manage. That is, they're essentially part of the team trying to help them when they get stuck. But if a technology is not working, we put the project on red alert and give them a finite time to recover. If it does, just does not work, we will terminate the project. We would rather put the, that money back in Treasury or fund better ideas than continue down an unsuc unsuccessful path. Number five, create value for a secure future. In March, we announced a partnership with the Department of Defense to co-develop energy storage systems so that forward operating bases can reduce their fuel consumption by more than 30%. As you know, energy is a national security issue, and nowhere is this more vital than in terms of military consumption of energy. In parallel, we have started a consortium of utilities in order to connect these breakthrough smart and clean energy technologies to the commercial sector as well. Just like the Internet and the GPS, we believe RPE-funded technologies will create whole new industries that do not exist today but could potentially open up large markets as well. But in 2000, back in 2009 and early 2010, six of our 120 projects received $24 million from RPE funding, which allowed these teams to do the research and reach the milestones ahead of schedule. Because of this de-risking of technologies, they then attracted more than $100 million in private sector investment this year, which is four times leveraging of the taxpayer federal dollars. Earlier this spring, we organized a very successful RPE Energy Innovation Summit, which was attended by more than 2,000 innovators. And uh, this is, we showcased not only the technologies that we funded, but also the technologies we could not fund. What, where will RPE go in the future? RPE will con continue to proactively seek out white spaces in energy technologies where it can fill vital gaps in energy R&D with coordination with departments' basic science and applied energy programs. For example, we in the United States have found the largest reserves of natural gas in the world. Can we use that in our transportation sector and reduce our oil use? Can we produce high-efficiency, low-cost engines and fuel cells to maximize the use of natural gas? Can we engineer new plants and crops that are designed to directly produce oil with extremely high yield? Can we store heat at high temperatures so that nuclear and fossil resources have the flexibility to meet peak demand in addition to baseload resources? Can we create light materials for high-energy density battery packs for electric vehicles? These are some of the opportunities that we plan to address should Congress provide the funding we have requested in the FI-12 budget. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, now recognize our second witness, Dr. Henry Kelly, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. Dr. Kelly. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Mil uh, Miller, and uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to let me talk about uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's energy efficiency and renewable uh, resources activities. Uh, ERE, as we're uh, commonly known, uh, supports research and development, demonstration and deployment activities on technologies and practices important for meeting uh, national goals to become more energy independent, uh, reduce pollution and spark innovation and entrepreneurship across America to help us win the global competition for new jobs and new industries. We shouldn't have any illusions that this is going to be an easy job. We face determined and increasingly sophisticated international competition. Nations such as China have carefully crafted plans to acquire the capability to begin low-cost manufacturing of innovative products developed principally by the U.S. in order to take leadership in the clean energy industry. 
We've lost market share in key parts of the, of the clean energy industry, including the production of solar devices, compact fluorescent lights, and many other areas. In fact, the U.S. Uh, producers had a 40 percent market share in photovoltaics a, a decade ago, but now we're below 7 percent world market share. But even more troubling, losing U.S. production uh, risks losing the incubators of innovation that begin to surround production of technologies like this. We've seen this happen in key areas like electronics, producing flat panel displays, data storage devices, and cell phones. We simply can't afford to let this happen in clean energy. The ERE programs I'll be laying out for you today are designed to ensure that we not only stem the loss in production uh, of these new technologies and reverse the loss in market share, but also return clean energy manufacturing to the United States. There's plenty of reason to, for optimism uh, on this score. Uh, many observers were, for example, confident that the U.S. had lost the lithium-ion battery uh, industry over overseas. It was declared a complete defeat for the United States a few years ago. But strategic investments uh, made largely in the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act means that we're well on our way to establishing capacity to produce enough batteries for uh, 500,000 plug-in and hybrid vehicles by 2015, hoping for a very large increase in uh, U.S. global market share. U.S. industry has been clear that in order to compete with determined foreign competitors who receive strong financial support from their governments, they need the U.S. government to invest in advanced research, promote regulations that encourage innovative solutions, and in some cases provide early stage financing for first-of-a-kind production. Nearly all the key technologies underlying today's clean energy equipment are the direct result of federal uh, research support over the years, including EERE support. This includes the batteries being used in all new uh, electric and hybrid vehicles, low emissivity windows that reduce heat conductivity and solar heat gain by at least 50 percent compared to standard windows and now represent over uh, half the uh, market share in the U.S. Uh, new processes with the potential to turn cellulose and cost effective, uh, bio, uh, into cost-effective biofuels and many more. And you'll see in my testimony there's a list of uh, some of our, of our other achievements. Now, the challenges we face mean that we have to build on the successes uh, of the past and move uh, with unprecedented speed and scale. Well-crafted federal programs are essential to spurring private innovation and investment. And EERE works in close collaboration with other DOE organizations that have uh, distinct but related missions, including the Loan Guarantee Office, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, and the Office of Science. We also work very closely with other federal agencies and state and local governments. Our principal goal is to find ways to reduce the, the cost of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies to the point where they can compete at current energy prices without any subsidy. That would be success for us. But ERE also works to identify the barriers uh, to the introduction of new uh, clean technologies that slow or block the introduction of new energy efficiency and renewable uh, technologies even when they're cost effective. We work to address these goals uh, in projects that include developing appliance standards, developing model building codes, improving consumer information by test methods that lead to labels like Energy Star and the Energy Guide labels, supporting the streamlining of uh, regulatory processes, uh, and uh, as well as uh, streamlining permitting and helping provide the funding for first-of-a-kind high-risk uh, production facilities. EERE has a mandate to help all federal agencies meet these goals. Because of the importance of EERE's technologies, the President's FY12 budget request uh, includes a significant increase for funding in this area, even as the administration seeks to reduce all overall domestic discretionary spending to the lowest levels in a generation. The technologies supported by EERE will be in high demand worldwide in coming years. If we do not move boldly and quickly to seize this opportunity, it will be lost to foreign producers. We can out-invent and out-compete any nation in the world, but only if we're willing to sustain the kinds of private-public partnerships that have driven so much of American innovation in the past, innovations that are now central to our economy. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions in the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. I now recognize our third witness, uh, Mr. David France of the Loan Guarantee Program Office at the Department of Energy. Mr. France. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chairman Harris, Ranking Member Miller, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would note that I was the first federal employee uh, of the uh, Loan Guarantee Program uh, and stood up the program in 2007-2008 prior to Jonathan Silver's arrival as the Executive Director of the Office. I welcome the opportunity today to review with you the status of the programs, 
The Department's success has achieved thus far and the future plans to continue providing critical support to the nation's commercial deployment of clean energy and creating jobs. As you know, Title 17 created S Section 1703 to address an urgent gap in financing for clean energy technologies. This circumstance became even more pronounced in the context of the recent economic recession. The resistance of the markets to early financing of innovative technologies has always been a challenge, but became even more acute during the recession. The urgent gap is called the valley of death in the clean energy development cycle between laboratory stage development and pilot facility stage operation to ultimate commercial applica application. The LPO, particularly with the advent of the Recovery Act, for appropriated subsidy has become a crucially important tool to bridge not only the financing gap, but to do so on an accelerated basis. Loan Programs Office actually administers three separate programs, the 1703, 1705 programs, as well as the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Incentive Program. The Section 1705 program was created as a part of the Recovery Act to jumpstart the country's clean energy sector by supporting commercially viable projects that had difficulty securing financing given the tight credit markets. The 1705 program has different objectives than 1703, somewhat different programmatic features. Most notable under 1705 is the appropriated credit subsidy costs, which are paid through 2.4 billion funds appropriated by Congress. Applicants must still pay application administrative fees. At this point, I would emphasize the fact that the program is required to be self-supporting under the law and by covering its administrative costs with earned fees. Therefore, we operate the program at no cost to the U.S. taxpayer. Additionally, to qualify for 1705 funding, projects must begin construction no later than September 30, 2011. DOE's authority to enter into loan guarantee agreements expires on that date as well. I'd like to take a minute to highlight some of the successes of the program to date. Since March 2009, the Department has issued conditional commitments for loans or loan guarantees to 30 projects, 16 of which have reached financial close with more to follow. The Department of Energy has provided or conditionally committed nearly $31 billion in financing to these 30 projects, which have total project costs of $48 billion. Spread across the country, they reflect an array of clean energy technologies such as wind, solar, advanced biofuels, nuclear, and more, including the world's largest wind farm, two of the world's largest concentrated solar power facilities, the first nuclear power plant uh, in the United States in the last three decades, and the world's first flywheel energy storage plant. Project sponsors estimate to us that these projects will create or save nearly 62,000 jobs, including construction and permanent uh, assignments. To date, DOE has committed and closed five ATVM loans, uh, over $8.3 billion supporting vehicle and component projects in eight states. We anticipate making many more loans in this category as well. It is important to remember that the loan program is not a grant program. Uh, the loan PO expects that the loans will be repaid. In fact, the law requires us as a statute requirement to have a reasonable prospect of repayment. We review these projects under a very rigorous uh, evaluation uh, exercise before we grant any of the loans. Uh, moreover, when the loan is fully repaid, the nation will have benefited from the private sector's investment at relatively little cost to the taxpayers. With the passage of the continuing resolution of FY 2011, uh, we've been provided an additional $170 million of appropriated subsidy. Uh, the Department is currently working to develop a process for implementing this new provision. The pre President's proposed 2012 budget request outlays the policy the priorities of the administration would support additional clean energy de development projects should Congress fund it to the levels required. In just over two years, in conclusion, the Department's loan programs are making a meaningful contribution to our national ener clean energy goals. Through the extraordinary efforts from arguably one of the most experienced and talented project finance staffs ever assembled, public or private, a prodigious amount of work is being accomplished in the program at an accelerated pace while maintaining the best practices of our industry. We look forward to continuing our progress and to working with Congress to ensure that the programs continue spurring clean energy deployment and job creation while appropriately protecting taxpayer funds. Thank you very much for inviting me today, and I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Franz. Uh, I want to remind members the committee rules limiting questions to five minutes. And uh, the chair is uh, first going to recognize the ranking member for questions, Mr. Miller. 
All right, that's an unusual procedure, but that's fine. Um, uh, we often hear the uh, phrase crowding out, that what the federal government is doing in this, in this area is crowding out uh, private investment, but, but uh, Mr. France just spoke of uh, the valley of death, a phrase that I have frequently heard from tech entrepreneurs uh, in my district, the Research Triangle area of North Carolina and, and actually the triad as well, where there are a couple of research universities, A&T and, and uh, UNCG. Um, Dr. Excuse me. Uh, Bujumar? Majumdar. Maj okay. Yeah. I, I'm doing the best I can. Um, how is the space um, for funding for energy research really that small? And how does uh, the research that is funded by RPE yeah. fit in with private uh, funding? Well, thank you, Congressman. I think this is a question that, you know, has been asked, and it's a very important question uh, and a, that really ought to be addressed. Actually, there are multiple valleys of death. And what RP is trying to do is to fill the first valley. And what is that valley? Is to translate science into breakthrough technologies that do not exist today. But if they did, they would make today's technologies obsolete. And that's the valley of death that we're trying to address. And let me give you an example. One of the examples that I gave in my, in my oral testimony is about the next generation battery that, you know, the, that does not exist today. And there's, frankly, a global race going on to develop that battery that will make electric cars cheaper than, um, than gasoline-based cars and have a longer range. That battery does not exist, and, you know, China is investing, Japan is investing, and, you know, there's a global race. And I think we need to sort of go back to our core competence, one of the core competences of our nation, which is the best science and engineering infrastructure in the world, and, and, and uh, empower them uh, to innovate these new technologies. Another example I would give is new ways of making oil. And we had a conversation, uh, uh, Congressman Harris, Chairman Harris, about this in your, in your office, that today's all the technologies that are there to create fuels um, in terms of using biology is using plants. And that's a route that, you know, a lot of uh, people in the industry and R&D infrastructure is taking. We decided to take a completely different route and, and call it electrofuels. And this is not using plants. This is using electricity that is generated locally and using non-photosynthetic microbes, and the biology is different, uh, to make fuels. And this turns out that it could be potentially 10 times more efficient than the way it is created biofuels. Now, there is no industry creating electrofuels today. If this is successful, we will create the industry. And so there is, you know, in fact, this is too risky for the private sector investment. So I don't think we are crowding out uh, private sector funding at all. There's, there, is, there is no field like that to start with. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do, which is exactly what, if you were to go to 1968, when DARPA started investing in Internet and in what is now called TCP IP, which is the routing and the protocols, et cetera. And at that time, there was no Internet industry. Um, in fact, the ARPANET did not even exist. They created it. And that's the kind of investment they made, and that you know, led to huge industries that were created. And RPE is trying to fill that first valley of death. And I don't think it's crowding out investment. But what we do invest in are technologies that are, that are too risky, but if they're successful, it will be attractive to the private sector, which is where we are seeing now, at least in some of the cases, where we have invested, let's say, $24 million in six technologies, which has then led with the R&D that has been done, reduced the risk, shown the results ahead of schedule, and that has led to more than $100 million in private sector investment. That is not you know, crowding out. That is actually unleashing the private sector investment after the federal dollars have gone in and allowed them to reduce the risk. Okay. Um, we hear about disrupting market mechanisms by government involvement, but it, it certainly doesn't look like there is a uh, there are pure market forces at work in, uh, in energy pricing. Uh, we don't um, reflect um, what we are doing in uh, very unstable parts of the world with our military uh, that may be driven in part by our concern about the, the stability of our energy supply. Uh, that's not reflected in, in oil and gas prices. Um, obviously, environmental damage is not really reflected in oil and price, uh, uh, oil and gas uh, prices or other energy prices. Um, the disruption, the 2003 um, blackout in the Northeast uh, was billions of dollars in economic disruption. That doesn't really get uh, the cost of that um, in, in a stable 
uh, grid uh, isn't really reflected um, either. How, how much of a lead time uh, for innovations uh, before they get to the market is really the point at which uh, the government should invest versus uh, the private sector might come in? Well, I think this is a problem. I mean, I would say this is exactly the right time to invest because we are not only looking at, uh, you mentioned the grid, about the, um, the asset wall that the utilities and the, the grid industry, the ISOs and RTOs, are going to face. Because many of the things that are there, components on the grid, uh, are more than 40 years old. They're beyond their lifetime right now. And once they start failing, as you, as you mentioned, in, in the Northeast, more might happen. And so there's a security aspect of the grid as well. So this is exactly the right time to invest in the grid to modernize our grid. In terms of uh, our transportation sector, you know, we, as, you know, as I mentioned, we are importing oil. We all know that, which is a national security issue. Mm -hmm. This is a national security issue not just for the United States. It is the same for China and other nations as well, which are importing oil. So there's a global race on to figure out how to use domestic resources like electricity for the transportation sector. And, and this global race is on right now, and I think if we do not invest in it today, we're going to fall back and fall behind, just like we did for the Sputnik range uh, era, where for a moment we had fallen behind, and that's where the United States went ahead and created DARPA, created NASA, and, things, and won the space age, and many other things came out of that. So I think this is exactly the right time to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Uh, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. Um, thank you very much again to the panel for being here. Dr. Majumdar, let me ask you a little bit about ARPA-E, because I, as we talked about, I, I love the idea of, of doing this, you know, funding through this first valley of death. But, you know, when we look through the list of some of the awards that have been made, there wasn't, they weren't in the valley of death, some of these companies. You know, I, the... Uh, the idea I would think would be to invest in these com invest in these ideas before others have. But you know, in uh, Flow Design, for instance, uh, which received an award, I believe, in the end of 2008 to develop wind turbine technology, actually uh, got an eight million dollar investment from venture capitalists 18 months before ARPA E invested eight million dollars. Now, one difference we, we talked about yesterday is because, I guess, of the buy dole rules. Uh, you know, the, the difference is those venture capitalists actually are going to make money when that, when that technology yields, but the federal government isn't. And yet we came in after venture capitalists making a, the, the same size uh, uh, investment. And it goes on. There are there, uh, flow design, uh, uh, planar energy devices, which also got $4 million from the federal government after $4 million from Battelle Ventures, which I'm pretty sure is a, a fairly substantial venture capital. Codexis uh, actually got $4 million, and th they actually went public and raised $78 million. Well, the difference is those shareholders are going to get a return. The federal government isn't. So my concern is that we are, uh, we are investing in, in really almost, it, it appears to be, technologies and companies that have actually demonstrated they can do something to people with real, real dollars, yet our mission is supposed to be before that point. So could you address that? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, let, me, let me clarify that. The policy that we have in RPE is not to invest in any ideas that have been invested in the private sector, not companies, ideas. So if you look at the flow design or any of the technologies, these companies may have been invested before for things that are short-term, that give you returns for the venture capital with, you know, in five years, et cetera. But these are the ideas that we invested in these companies are not the ones that the, that the venture capital invested in. But, but Doc, you, yeah, let me just, because I only have five minutes, let me just ask, though, uh, although that's true, if those new, t those different technologies make money for that company, it's going go well, to I mean, go to the venture capitalists who were there before who invested in the initial idea. That's usually the venture capital set up, as you're aware of. Is that, sure. I mean, that's, that's what I suspect. Thank you very much. Thanks for confirming what I suspect. Uh, Dr. Kelly, let me ask you uh, some questions because, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate your testimony. One of the things it says in your testimony is that uh, your key goal is put one million electric vehicles on the road by 2015, so four years from now. Uh, what are you doing to make sure there's actually electricity at the other end of the socket when, when those cars get plugged in? 
I mean, you know, we just we just had an announcement by the EPA that they're they're issuing uh, regulations on mercury emissions in plants. It's going to result co coal fire plants actually shutting down. Actually, you know, being this administration directly will cause the closing of electric capacity in the country. And as you know, nuclear power is kind of on hold. So what is EERDE doing uh, to make sure there's actually something that comes out of the outlet when you plug in the electric car that's actually affordable? So it has to be something low cost. Well, as I pointed out, that our main goal here is to try to drive down the price of renewable electricity to the point where it's fully competitive uh, with uh, traditional forms of, of energy. We're getting very close to that. We have uh, photo. How, how close are we on photovoltaics well, in, photo in, in, in something that's scalable? Well, we have a SunShot program whose goal it is to make uh, this. Dr. Kelly, it's not, not, I'm not the goal. I'm something that's scalable right now because well, they're going to plug in electric cars now. Chevy Volt's out there. It's plugging in. Is there any technology that you've invested in that's actually scalable to a, at a cost of 5 or 6 or 7 cents a kilowatt hour, which is what coal is priced at? Well, wind is competitive in many parts of the country. Let me ask you about that because you're a little further down in your testimony, you actually mentioned offshore wind as being competitive for conventional source of electricity without subsidy. Now, Dr. Kelly, everything I read says that offshore wind is absolutely not competitive with uh, with, oh, with uh, c conventional source of technology because of the increased infrastructure cost to bring that energy into the grid. Am I reading the wrong things? Oh, it's way too expensive right now. I mean, way more expensive. Okay, so offshore wind is not one of those it's techniques. Not, um, if, so there really is if, nothing that EERE has done that, that, will in, that will make sure that when you plug in that electric vehicle that we actually can buy electricity for five or six or seven cents a kilowatt hour. If something that's at that stage of technical maturity, we should have been out of it a long time ago. We should be at the cutting edge of technology. L let me ask you one final question. My time has run out. You actually uh, mentioned clean energy sources. You're promoting clean energy. Do you consider natural gas a clean energy source, as the President did in his State of the Union address? Yeah, the, the President has a, a definition of clean energy that includes uh, partial credit for natural gas, clean energy. Okay, what, what has EERD done? done to promote natural gas as a clean energy source? Well, we have uh, looked at, we've supported some uh, natural gas powered vehicles. Uh, oh, yeah, in the second round, we're going to get to that. Thank you very much. Uh, I will recognize Ranking Member Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and let me thank the ranking member as well. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to put a statement in the record, but I do have a question. Um, it has been good to hear so many accomplishments in such a short time, a period of time that um, you have had to achieve these, and um, and and, and oh, I guess. We all have to work to reshape the department and, we'll, and do all we can to eliminate waste, collaboration, what have you. Um, before the majority's um, budget cuts take effect, uh, I'm glad we're having this hearing because I think that many of the proposed cuts are irresponsible. Uh, we, they might not claim to pick winners and losers, and it is clear uh, you know, what sector they favor, and that's good, except that I do think that we have a major, very major uh, role to play. Uh, after investing billions of dollars uh, from the stimulus a few years ago, we are finally beginning to see uh, that these new technologies do flourish. And uh, when we run into cuts, uh, we really dismantle, we lose talent, um, and we end up starting over. So what what will uh, these additional cuts to clean energy do uh, to DOE? Because it's clear that we need all of the above and looking for alternative energies. I have a different um, take on the White House pulling the plug on so much stuff. I think that, as I understand it, what we're trying to do is find some alternative ways of, of getting ahead and trying to stay on the world's playing field. So if you will give me an idea as to how directly uh, any additional cuts will, will affect these programs. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman. Uh, I think this is the President uh, has made clean energy a priority. I, I believe, this, and he has said that in his State of the Union 
a message that we need to out-innovate, out-build, and out-educate uh, the rest of the world. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, oral statement, that this is the energy uh, and innovations in energy is at the foundation of our national security, as uh, our economic security, our economic prosperity of our children and grandchildren, as well as um, our environmental security. So I think if we do not support clean energy at this point, I, I believe our future, our children's future and our grandchildren's future are at stake because we are in a globally competitive world which, are, which is focusing on this particular issue. Well, I, I certainly agree with what uh, Dr. Majumbar has just said. I think that this, the President has said that this is a Sputnik moment, and it's a Sputnik moment because, uh, like Sputnik, we've gotten a wake-up call. We've gotten a wake-up call that the technologies that are going to dominate world markets uh, in the future in clean energy may no longer be made in the United States. Uh, so not only are we going to slow the rate of introduction of things like uh, the clean sources of electricity that are com uh, competitive with uh, conventional sources that are also meet the environmental goals, uh, we're not going to be able to take advantage of uh, world markets and efficient light bulbs in the next generation of heating and cooling equipment. Uh, we're not going to be able to go in and retrofit the buildings that uh, we work in and live in so that we can save uh, the people who live in them, the, uh, protect them against the uh, exigencies of, uh, of rising prices. We're going to find ourselves uh, facing constantly fluctuating prices in, uh, in the price of, of driving. So the technologies uh, and the businesses and the jobs that are created by solving these problems are going to be uh, abroad and not here, and that's what we're risking. Do you have? Uh, I would simply reiterate uh, the point of my two colleagues that uh, our continued involvement and activity in this space, we believe, is critically important and, and should continue at a robust pace. Uh, we're very pleased that Congress has appropriated in the continuing resolution the $170 million for appropriated subsidy, which will certainly help uh, activity in the renewable space for us. But that's just a small step. We're, we're very hopeful that uh, the funding will continue for this program uh, because we are very, uh, in, in a non-neutral uh, taxpayer cost basis, contributing uh, mightily now to job creation and, and uh, the, the employment of these new technologies. Thank you. My time is expired. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, uh, both the subject that you have chosen for today and also your leadership in this issue. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to Dr. Everybody's having trouble with your name. I'm sorry, Dr. Majumba. Majumdar. Okay, got it. Now, I, I, I <laughs> Majumba, thank you. Rohrbacher, everybody gets that all, they gets that all wrong as, as well. I hope your question is easier than my last name. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, you were talking about battery research that you have been funding. Uh, how much total is the funding for battery research for uh, for the transportation sector from RPE? Well, uh, uh, RPE just for battery research. It's about on the order of about forty or fifty million dollars. Forty or fifty million dollars, and uh, that has been invested so far. Okay, and. How much – are you aware of how much money is being spent in the private sector to develop battery, new battery technology? For the next generation batteries that we are investing in, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of the ones that we have invested in. Mm -hmm. For example, the all-electron battery, which is going on at Stanford University, for example, there is no all-electron battery today. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's – you know, I don't think there is any investment in that. Uh, in the other – a lithium-ion flow battery that is, uh, you know, that is being developed at MIT. Uh, there was no lithium-ion flow battery. There is, so, so, so companies that now are, you don't, uh, you don't know, you are unaware of private companies that have invested large amounts of money in battery uh, technology. Oh, they have been, they have been investing in lithium-ion battery that is going into, well, you know, the, the Chevy Volts and things like the, that today, but not in the batteries that we have invested in. Magnesium-ion battery. I guess you get down. You don't know of any companies that are involved with developing new battery technology? Not the high-risk ones that we are investing in. Not the high-risk ones yeah. that you are investing These in. These are risky propositions, and, mm -hmm. you know, many of them will fail. 
And, uh, you know, that's the okay. kind of risk that the now, federal government... Now, if you government... succeed, if you succeed, these batteries succeed, let's say, um, in the private sector, the people who are investing their money will get their money back and actually make a big profit on it. Uh, what will the American taxpayers get out of this except, of course, a better society, but are they going to get a payback if uh, this new battery technology actually works? Well, if it works, I, I, I certainly hope, and I think you have shared your concern in the past that the manufacturing of these technologies, if it's created out here, remains in the United States, and that's, I share your concern on that. And the manufacturings will lead to jobs. And yeah. just like if you go back in the okay, history... But, but the actual profit from the technology what you're trying to get around is not telling me that the American taxpayers won't get a penny back. Well, we could create a different system, but that's the system that people I know. have been that's following right. that's right. so far. I mean, and would you like to see a system where, or would you advocate a system where if you invest in a new technology and it's the taxpayers who are paying for it, it that ownership of that technology isn't just passed on and profited by people who haven't been doing the investing? I'll be happy to work with you on that. All right, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that is a very important, uh, yes. significant point. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, our last witness. Uh, you were mentioned. I noticed in your testimony you talked about $31 billion in financing to 30 projects uh, that are I, their loans that you've given to these energy projects. Are any of them uh, nuclear projects? Well, yes, included uh, in that project is the uh, Vogel project in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have that, that project, as a matter of fact, uh, Congressman will be the first to receive the, the nuclear regulatory license expected in November, and we, we're already in the closing process. Could of you describe treatment. that project for us? Well, it's, uh, it, it's the first uh, nuclear project sponsored by the Southern Company. There are uh, three other are investors. These, are these... Uh, 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 small modular reactor? No, they are not, Are sir. they gas-cooled reactors? No, this is the Westinghouse 1000. This is 1, uh, money that's been put into light water reactors? Uh, I'm not familiar with the specific now, technology. Let me just note, Mr. Chairman, light water reactors have been around for a long time, and this may be a new approach. No, it is. It is. Okay. This is, this uh, well, is a new that, technology. Well, then this why is haven't we put money into, instead of just new, to new approaches like the high-temperature gas-cooled reactors, or how about these small modular reactors? Have we put money into those concepts? We, our program has not. Uh, I don't know if right. there are other programs so, within the So department. we have a, a major expenditure into a light water reactor with a new approach, which is an old concept, I might add, of how to produce nuclear energy. But the modular reactors, which uh, are being heralded as really revolutionary, as well as the high temperature gas cool reactors, which are revolutionary as well, have not been invested in. I would suggest that uh, perhaps there should be a second look. I notice your staff has given you a little note there if you'd like to answer that. But uh. Uh, well, we, can, we can take um, this question for the record and, f and make a more fulsome response to your question, Congressman, All right. through our nuclear group. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. And we've been told that we could begin voting as early as 3.15, so I'd ask the members to uh, keep to the five-minute limit as much as you can. And I'm going to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Or Dr. Moon Jamdar, uh, thank you for coming here today. Uh, and I'm uh, glad to be from Northern California where a lot of the innovation is happening, and, uh, and I think we're doing a great job there at ARPA-A. Uh, do you see that the private sector uh, supports your mission of investing in high-risk, uh, high-reward projects. Do you see evidence of that? I think there's, there's general support um, by the private sector um, in, the, in, the, in our mission in some of the things that we invested because, as I said before, uh, these are too risky for the private sector. No one is going to invest in an electrofuel, which is a completely different biological route for creating fuel because it did not exist before. And, um, and f when, when I talk about this to the private sector, uh, they feel that, you know, this is too risky for them. So I think there is a tremendous amount of support because we don't know which one's going to win at the end, and we are not going to pick the winners. But I think out of the 15 or 16 technologies where the competition has been created, which is what we did, you know, some of them may succeed, and then we let the private sector pick the winners. But at this stage, this early, early stage, 
uh, I don't think the private sector can invest. And so that's, that's exactly where we are, is filling that first valley of death. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Franz, uh, is it fair to say that the loan guarantee program, which was first created by the Republican Congress or Republican-dominated Congress, uh, will help the private sector companies create jobs that, uh, main, that uh, are maintained after the loans are repaid? Oh, certainly. I mean, our, the objective of our program, in fact, our rule specifies that we are to only do three projects in a specific sector operating for five years as an example, as a precursor to the investment in the private markets to follow our lead on those projects. So it's our absolute objective to set the, to set the path and then to vacate to the private markets. And then those jobs are maintained. Do you have uh, yes. any experience with that, jobs being maintained after the uh, loans are repaid? Well, no. I mean, the, the jobs, our projects, all of our projects are long-term projects. Most of our loans, the, lo the shortest loan that I'm familiar with is at least 10 years. So these are permanent assignments, particularly in the manufacturing and the new solar manufacturing and in the generation space that are creating permanent jobs that will last many years so after our loan is repaid. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Kelly, uh, can you describe how the work undertaken by your department has translated into financial benefits, real financial benefits for American families? Well, it does this in uh, two ways. Um, first of all, it's developing products that help save energy and money. So you can drive a vehicle that's more efficient. Uh, and you can have a home that's more comfortable and uses much less energy. Uh, so that uh, benefit direct directly uh, translates into uh, uh, things that are useful to Americans. But at the same time, it sets up an ability to produce the technologies that achieve those goals, which means uh, setting up factories that make uh, lithium-ion batteries, that make uh, next-generation lighting. And so this, is, been, this uh, is recognized worldwide as one of the areas of, of rapid growth, and it's a place where uh, U.S. investment can generate a lot of new business opportunities and jobs. Okay, so not only will the products save money, by uh, lowering consumption, uh, but they also create jobs in America which will benefit the economy as a whole. That's basically what you're saying. Exactly. Thank you. From a pol policy perspective, then, what are the, some of the biggest barriers uh, to the more widespread development of renewable energy technologies? Well, we, uh, we of course, <clears throat> need to drive the price down so that you don't have a price differential. And I think we're well on a track to doing that in a number of different technical areas. But as I said in my statement, just because you have the price down doesn't mean that you have a guaranteed market for this. There are many places, for example, on siting uh, wind or uh, photovoltaic fields, uh, you know, utility-scale fields, you, the regulatory uh, problems are enormous. You have five or six different agencies and a lot of complexity. So we are part of an interagency team that is going to greatly streamline that. Do you see transmission as an issue? Transmission uh, is a major issue. Uh, there are a lot of issues having to do with... Uh, the way utilities communicate with each other. There are a lot of contractual uh, problems that you, you run into. So we're, we're trying to work with the Office of Electricity to try to make sure that we have the most efficient electricity market uh, in, in the world, but that the, it's also compatible with the introduction of, of intermittence. Of course, one of the problems of uh, some kinds of solar lights uh, is that it's variable, and you have to integrate this variable uh, input into a utility, which is a complex process. Okay, thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. McNerney. I recognize my colleague from Maryland, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. I wanted to spend a few moments in putting our discussions in context. I think the staff has been able to load a couple of slides for me, if they could put the first one on the screen. Okay, yeah, this is a slide from um, World Energy Outlook from uh, 08. And note several significant things there. The dark blue at the bottom is conventional oil. We've been pumping more and more of that as we've used more and more, but now for the last five years we've reached a plateau. That conventional oil plus the two bars above it, which is unconventional oil and natural gas liquids, uh, add up to 84 million barrels a day. That's where we are today, 84 million barrels a day. Note what's going to happen. They run this out to 30. Note what happens. 
conventional oil is going to go down, down, down. That happened in our country in 1970. Now we produce half the oil that we produced in 1970 in our country in spite of drilling more oil wells than all the rest of the world put together. Notice the, the really dark red slice there, a small one, that's enhanced oil recovery. The uh, brighter red below that is oil that they say we're going to find from fields we haven't even found yet. These are fields yet to be discovered. And the light blue wedge there is, is uh, developing fields we have already discovered, like one in the Gulf of Mexico, under 7,000 feet of water, 30,000 feet of rock. Pretty tough to develop that field. So when oil is more expensive than $100 a barrel, they may start doing that. Notice that by 2030, they thought that we would be producing 106 million barrels of oil a day. Just two years later, the next slide shows you what's happened. Just two years later, ah, there's now the next slide. There's the next slide, just two years later. The next one, okay, two years later. The two uh, wedges on top have flipped, and, and so you have to notice that. They're different colors and they flipped out. But not, and they run this out to 35. Notice that by 35, how little oil they believe that we're going to be getting from conventional oil. Notice that the, the little dark red one I mentioned in has the oil recovery, that's disappeared. That's now incorporated. That's now incorporated in the conventional oil. They have huge slices there for... Um, Oil to be developed from fields we've discovered, and the light blue up there fields yet to be discovered. Uh, those two wedges will not happen to that extent. They just won't happen. The world oil output is going to follow the United States world output, and we've been going down, down, down since 70. Notice, and maybe you can see it up there, too far away for me to see, but already they're showing a dip down in the total production of oil at the top. They're prognosticating that that's going to go up. I do not think that will go up. The point I wanted to make with this was that the, the uh, market forces did not result in uh, any clean or alternative energy investments and anticipation of peak oil. Your government has paid for four reports, two of them issued in 05, two of them issued in 07. The big SAIC, the Hearst report in 05, the Corps of Engineers report in 05, the Government Accountability Office report, GAO report in 07, and the National Petroleum Council report in 07. All four reports saying the same thing, a message your government did not want to hear, so they simply turned a deaf ear and paid no attention to it. The reports all said that the peaking of oil is either present or imminent with potentially devastating consequences. The Hearst report said that the world has never faced a problem like this. You know, the social and, and economic consequences of this are unprecedented, is what they said. Unless we anticipated it by a decade, there would be very serious social and economic consequences of this. I, I put these slides up there to kind of put this in context. You know, we should have started a couple of decades ago. We knew very well, we knew of an absolute certainty, 31 years ago, in 1980, when we look back at 1970, and we could see very clearly that M. King Hubbard was right about the United States, we did peak in oil production in 1970. And the United States has to be a microcosm of the world. It happened, if it happened in the United States, it should happen in the world. The only question was, when was it going to happen in the world? So we now have blown 31 years, we knew with an absolute certainty we, we would be here today, peaking in conventional oil production with essentially no possibility of making up for, the, for the, the fall off in conventional oil production by oil from other sources. So we should have started two or three decades ago with the technologies that you are now working on. It is desperately important, my hope is, my prayer is, that ARPA-E can do for us what DARPA did for, for these other programs, because if it don't, we're in a heap of trouble and the world is in a heap of trouble. I think that once again we can become a manufacturing, exporting nation. We're clearly still the most creative, innovative society in the world if we just get turned on and our people know, but they haven't been told, they don't know because your government has refused to tell the people the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bartlett. I uh, recognize uh, Mr. Lujan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I almost want to give Dr. Bartlett five more minutes. I really appreciated <laughs> that conversation and where I it was I'm going. sure he had five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> With that, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for this hearing. And Dr. Uh, Majum Dar, is that correct, sir? That's exactly right. Um, I'm a big supporter of technology transfer, and we've had a chance to visit about this in this uh, committee, as well as amongst our colleagues in, in many capacities. And we've actually started a tech transfer caucus to talk about these kinds of ideas. 
some view ARPA E as a top down technology transfer program. Uh, that is, technology transfers, uh, specific technologies that have been identified or pushed from the top down. DOE as a uh, technology transfer coordinator, uh, please describe how you're working with Dr. Edmonds as we talk about DOE's application technology transfer as it, as it uh, impacts you in this area. Thank you, Congressman. Um, let, let me just describe, first of all, RPE. I mean, RPE is not a technology transfer uh, office. It is a innovation office. It's a technology innovation office, as I said, to provide some thought leadership and get the community uh, engaged in a technology development creation, which does not exist today, and if it did, it's just too risky for the hype, you know, for the private sector. And if, just in clarification, understanding yeah. the role of ARPA E, what what are you doing to work with yeah, uh, Dr. Edmonds with Dr. Edmonds yes. to make sure that we're pushing this technology out as well? Right. Understanding the constraints that DOE has, right. unlike those with the intelligence community, DHS, DOD, where they have that private sector component that they can match right. up. We're working very closely with Dr. Edmonds in terms of technology transfer. Um, you know, she has, when she, after she joined uh, the Department of Energy, she has worked with all the national labs, for example, to create this American Energy Innovator Award. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, it's a competition that will be announced in our next RPE Energy Innovation Summit, which is going to be end of February next year, just like we had, you know, this year. And, and, and in this period, she has reduced the cost of licensing from all the national labs to about $1,000. Uh, for a certain period of time so that it takes the IP that has been created and, and offers it up to the entrepreneurs and, and innovators, take that IP and create businesses. And that's the kind of thing that she's been doing, and we're working very closely with her. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Dr. Kelly, EERE established the Efficiency and Renewables Advisory Committee to ensure that EERE is focusing on transformative research to achieve technological innovations that move quickly into the marketplace and expedite job growth. Can you comment on the effectiveness that EARC has in helping to guide the department's investments in renewable energy technologies? And what do you envision ERAC's role in promoting clean energy job growth? Uh, well, thank you for the question. The, as you know, this is a new group we've put together, and it has uh, a number of functions, but one of them is to uh, get advice from a very diverse community uh, on the on the way, not only how we're choosing our research, but also how we're trying to transfer and get it uh, adopted. Uh, the, one of the great concerns we've got or a lot of the concerns that have been expressed by this committee is to make sure that we are, in fact, supporting innovation uh, and not competing with other sources of investment. So we have a heavy, a significant representation from the venture capital community. The uh, former head of research at General Electric is on the committee. The former head of technology at Honeywell is on the committee. So they have been helping us work with the financial community to make sure how we can uh, constructively engage uh, the private sector. They've also allowed us to make contacts uh, with people who, can, uh, who weren't aware of our problems, uh, of the kinds of challenge, research challenges we've worked on to make so we can broaden the scope of the people that we work with. So they've been very effective to, both in helping us open up and make our process more transparent and helping us uh, shape our programs. Appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit a few more questions into the record if I can't get to them with that second round of questioning as, as well as uh, some opening comments. Without objection. Uh, Dr. Ka or Mr. Fran, sorry. Um, in order to take full advantage of renewable capacity, as we see across the country, I appreciate the question by Congressman McNerney around transmission. Um, if we're going to be able to solve our nation's constraints for delivering power, when we talk about electrons being generated from any fuel source, but especially where there's renewable opportunities, can you talk about how the guaranteed loan program can help accelerate that? Certainly. Uh, I think it's important for uh, – thank you for the question, Mr. C Congressman, and, and uh, for the entire committee's benefit. Uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, our program initiates through applications uh, on a competitive basis. So uh, in the first instance, we have to issue a solicitation for specific sectors, which we have done for transmission. Uh, we have closed uh, a, a transmission project among the 16 we have closed. We've closed the, the Southwest Intertie in the state of Nevada. We have three other major projects in presently in the due diligence that I can't discuss right now publicly. Uh, so we're acutely aware of the need 
for upgrade and, and financing in transmission, and in particular, uh, among those new solar generation projects that we are currently in the process of financing, there are critical issues associated with the expansion of the uh, transmission systems, particularly in the Southwest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I recognize our colleague from Illinois, Ms. Biggert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this um, uh, uh, subcommittee hearing. I, uh, I've got a question for Mr. Majumdar. Uh, about RPE, uh, the uh, FY12 budget uh, request for RPE includes $100 million uh, in mandatory spending to be spent to uh, develop cutting-edge wireless technologies. Uh, my question is why uh, do innovative wireless companies, and it could be Motorola, it could be Apple, or there's a lot of various companies, but why do they need an additional $100 million uh, uh, dollars to fund wireless technology development? Is there, is there a concern that there's a lack of incentive for uh, innovation uh, within the wireless technology sector? Why is that singled out? Well, uh, first of all, Congresswoman, uh, let me, before I answer that, let me just mm -hmm. thank all of you for making such an effort to pronounce my last name. <laughs> I, I think my mother will be very appreciative of that. <laughs> Um, this fund is a mandatory fund, as, as you pointed out, uh -huh. and this is for wireless technology, and this is not for the Motorola's and other tech. Uh, yeah. This is really for looking at, let me just give you an example. Yeah. If you look at the grid today, um, it is a system that does not have feedback control. It is sort of what is called open loop, which is why when in the Northeast there's an instability, the instability grows and just breaks apart, I'm sorry, breaks apart the whole grid and you have yeah. failure. And to be able to manage that, and it is what is called, in mathematical terms, a nonlinear system, and which, are, which go into what is called also chaotic behavior. This is a field of mathematics and science that needs to be developed in what is called distributed control. And for that, you need the wireless communication. This is an area of science or, or wireless technology that has not gone in. Wireless gone talk technology in iPhones and, sure. and Blackberries, et cetera, but not, for example, in controlling the grid because the technology that is needed for that, which will be developed in the universities and the national labs, et cetera, around the country, uh, has to be different and has to be integrated yeah. in the right well, way. Well, who, who makes that decision? Well, in terms of the technologies? No, who makes the decision that, that we should have the wireless technology, the, the, the $100 million? Well, I think this is, uh, this is I think, I mean, has to it, go through Congress uh, in terms of, I don't know which committee that has, okay. but it has to be approved through that. And if, should it be approved? Then that's the fund, you know. But it, but it comes from RPE. No, it, comes, it comes through from RPE DOE? through Congress's approval. Okay. All right. I I, I guess I get it, but it, it seems like can, somebody has to have the idea that yes, we need to do this. Yeah. And I don't think that it, is it somebody in in uh, energy and commerce that is deciding that, or is it? I can get back to you right, with the yeah. committee that is okay. responsible for that. Um, I, I don't exactly know which committee that is. Okay, but it is the committee. Yes. Okay, that was what my question. Then, uh, Mr. Franz, um, I understand that uh, there's about 500 different uh, companies that have applied for loans uh, uh, for the loan guarantee program, uh, but only about 30 awards have been made. Uh, doesn't the um, the reality of limited funding for the the, the program uh, relative to uh, qualified uh, applicants result in picking winners and, and losers among competing companies? Uh, no, uh, uh, your mic. Yeah. Um, we, we do not pick winners and losers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our whole process is handled through a competitive application process. And the driving factor among all is readiness to proceed. Uh, so we, we, are, we do not spend any time uh, w concerned about geographic distributions or even the specific sectors. We look at the applications purely from a, a very rigorous underwriting uh, uh, perspective, and we, we work on those uh, in prior, a prioritized fashion on fully the basis of a readiness to proceed with, with the, the, tr the transaction itself. So you you don't think that um, that the government involvement uh, 
would result in uh, a crowding out of, of some of the private uh, investment that would rather not uh, compete against the government-backed companies? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, as I indicated uh, in my prepared testimony, mm -hmm. the, there are uh, we by by the allocation measure that Congress has given us, as well as the appropriated subsidy among those applications that we are now working on, we fully expect to utilize all of the uh, appropriated subsidy in the allocation. Okay, and I thank you, and I did miss the, your uh, testimony, so I'm glad that you pointed that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Thank you very much. We're going to be called to vote, uh, we believe, within the next 15 minutes. So we're going to allocate five minutes to each side uh, for one additional set of questions. And I, uh, I recognize uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, uh, Dr. Kelly, the um, investments uh, in EERE uh, technologies, um, uh, have there been similar uh, investments uh, in the past? to the kinds of things we're doing now through EERE? Oh, yes. We have what we think is a proud track record of uh, supporting energy technologies. Uh, I mentioned a few. Uh, you know, of course, uh, most of the uh, – we have over half the windows now are extremely efficient because of our investments. The, we've gone through several generations of batteries. The batteries that were in the first generation of hybrids, uh, the nickel metal hydride batteries, uh, were the direct result of what we've done. We've now, of course – our goal in all of this is to – uh, get the heck out of the business and let the private sector take over, and uh, that's how we define success, and that's happened in many many occasions. Okay, um, it, it it in the testimony to this point, it sounds like all these agencies are actually talking to each other, which is pretty refreshing, um, uh, and uh, and also to the private sector. How do you get uh, suggestions, or do you get suggestions, and if so, how do you get suggestions from the private sector? Um, on how to structure the pro uh, programs, what the priorities ought to be. Dr. Mujumdar or Dr. Kelly? Well, I mean, we spend a lot of time not only talking to the industry um, and the businesses, but also talking to the academia, really the sort of the intellectual horsepower of this nation in academia and national labs, et cetera, to identify where are the white spaces, the big gaps. And that is done in coordination with the applied energy offices, with the EERE, for example, fossil energy and others, and as well as with uh, the basic energy sciences and the office of science. And using that, we identify the white spaces that, that is too risky, again, for the private sector, that no one has created this technology. But should a technology be created, this would change the ball game and become a quantum leap in technology. And that's how we create, that, that's how we identify the white space and then create the technology just exactly the way in DARPA created internet, GPS, et cetera. Okay. Dr. Kelly, you don't have to add if you don't want to, but you can. Well, just very briefly, we've, uh, you know, we try very hard to, to get the uh, understanding of what the what industry is going to do and what they're not going to do. Uh, typically, we, we hold a series of workshops. Uh, many of them have been jointly with uh, ARPA-E and mm -hmm. science and uh, sort of triangulate on them. Uh, one of the, our flagship projects is, is Sunshot, and we've had a number of workshops with all parts of the industry and, and uh, regularly meet with it. This is, these are shared with ARPA-E, and they bring in venture people, they bring in companies, they bring in academics, and we develop uh, very precise roadmaps of where we want to go and then have that reviewed by the community. Okay. Uh, Dr. M uh, Mujumdar, um you talked about intellectual horsepower in this area a moment ago, and in your, and in your testimony, uh, you said that one of the indicators of success would be the ability to attract the best minds to energy uh, R&D. How is ARPA-E going about that? Is that one of your goals and how do you do it? Very actively. I think this is the time that if we are to create a future of clean energy and, and provide the security for our children and grandchildren, uh, it is extremely important what, to parallel what we did in information technology and biotechnology, that is to get the best minds in science and engineering in the best biologists, the best anesthesiologists, perhaps, and the best you know, computer scientists and the material scientists to say, can you offer your, your, your knowledge and, and your intellect and the creativity to address the problems so that we can get our foreign oil, so we, we can provide the security for, for future generations. So this is, we're actively pursuing that. We're trying to get people from the other fields as well 
And it's not only just me and, and my colleagues out here. Secretary Chu is trying to do the same as well, to get the physicists and the chemists involved and looking at the energy issues, not just the medical issues, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is a very active pursuit for us. How will cuts to the RPE budget affect your ability to attract, to, to get the horses, uh, the intellectual horsepower, to, to bring in the best minds um, for energy? I think this will, you know, it will severely hamper. I mean, it, it is, it's absolutely true. I've been an academic myself in the past. And if you are trying to do research, you want to see whether there's an assurance of funding down the line. And, you know, if, they, if, if that, is not, that assurance is not there, we're not going to get the best minds to solve the energy problems of our future. And so it is extremely important that we have sustained funding. Exactly as I said before, you know, ARPA, you know, ARPA net started in 1968 and took sustained funding over 20 years to make it, to create ARPANET and to make it compatible for creating businesses in, in the commercial world. That kind of sustained funding is absolutely critical if you are to create the clean energy future and address the issues that Congressman Bartlett raised for our future. Okay. Our time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, and in a second here, when Mr. Bartlett returns, I'm going to yield uh, 30 seconds, and he wants to show one more slide. So, <laughs> but let me, let me, uh, let me just start. Uh, Dr. Kelly, um, I, I respect that, w that we have to, you know, we want to spend this money, we want to create American jobs, we want to make ourselves efficient, but I've got uh, information, there's some press release that have been sent out that, that would suggest that EERE actually spends money, for instance, uh, I'm going to quote here, engages in multiple technology and policy efforts to improve energy efficiency in the Chinese building sector. Now. Look, I'm all for energy efficiency, but I got to believe it should start here in the United States first. Why is the why is your uh, shop spending money uh, to to improve energy efficiency in the Chinese building sector? I mean, we're we're literally borrowing money from them because every dollar, every additional dollar we spend is a dollar borrowed from China. Why would we, as good policy, be borrowing money from China to spend it to make their energy? their building sector energy efficient. What that press release was about, but uh, as you know, the Chinese are building an enormous uh, numbers of, of buildings. They're building the equivalent it's, of... Yeah, now yeah, just to say, just to answer that, your question, it yeah. says key, e, key EERE partnerships in the building sectors in China include the code standards and labeling projects, software design tools and training for energy efficient design, uh, d d d uh, building design project. These are all from, your, from the website. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we have started uh, recently is a joint research program with the uh, Chinese that will not move any of our money to China, but will, uh, we're, we're setting up a research program here in the United States funded partly by us and partly by business. They've set up a parallel operation in China. They're actually a very sophisticated in many of the areas that uh, we are doing research in. So there, there are areas where we can learn as much from them as they're learning from us. In fact, we can learn a lot from them. And so we want to make sure we take advantage of the areas where they do want to collaborate on uh, partnerships. On so, so you think we're going to get something from China on this? You uh, think we're that good bargainers with the Chinese? Uh, well, I, I hope. It, it, the good thing about research, particularly these sort of basic issues, is that it really is a win-win situation. I and mean, we have to be careful we choose the right areas. But there are places where, by collaborating, we both end up... Uh, but, but this is to this isn't to improve energy efficiency in general. It's to improve it in the Chinese building sector. And we'll we'll probably go ahead and, and you know submit a, uh, some questions in writing that might uh, follow up with that. Uh, now, Mr. France, I did have one question because the way the way the loan program worked it changed a little bit over the last few years because now there are, there are uh, federal dollars that are going to pay the cost of the of this guarantees that flow. So your statement that it doesn't cost, and I, and I, I think I wrote it down, that it, the quote is that it, it no cost to the U.S. taxpayer. But in fact, the U.S. taxpayer is paying the cost of that premium to guarantee the loan. Well, my assertion in my testimony, Mr. Chairman, was uh, the fact that all of our admin, the, the, the overhead and admin is covered. Beyond by. admin. There is yeah. a cost to the U.S. That's taxpayer right. this program. But, but, the, the, but the point is it's in the form of loan or loan guarantees which are repaid in contradistinction to a grant. So but, but we the, expect that, to be fully repaid for that. But that premium, 
If it's not, I don't, I don't understand. We're, we're paying a premium to guarantee that loan. The, the, I, you're probably referring to the credit subsidy. Yes, the credit subsidy. subsidy. I like that word subsidy because when for the oil companies is bad, but here it's good, I guess. So that's that. Yeah. The subsidy, the subsidy is what the under the Federal Credit Reform Act of 1990 is a loan loss reserve, which is required by that law for all federal government loan programs. In most federal government programs, that, that subsidy is appropriated by Congress. And the reason is it's such a terrific burden to all the applicants. In the original concept of the 1703 program designed to be tax cost neutral to the taxpayer, that is a self-pay subsidy program. So all of our large projects are under the 1703 program, the nuclear program, the fossil program. That all has to be paid by our applicants. Right. So, so, so in fact, in the 1705 program, there really is a cost to the U.S. taxpayer. There is. Uh, okay. It's not administrative, but it's that other. And, and of course, that program, as I mentioned, is expiring on September 30th. So. Sure. No, I understand that. And uh, with regards to the loan programs, you know, the, the only disconcerting thing, I think, and one of the reasons why we hold the hearing is that, you know, we open up the paper, and whether it's Politico yesterday or ABC News, you know, we hear about loan guarantees going to companies where people made very large contributions to people in the administration, very large political contributions, large. How are you going to assure me that the system does not uh, – is not biased. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to submit that in writing, because if you can submit that in writing to me, because I'm going to recognize uh, Dr. Bartlett for 30 seconds to show his slide, and then we're going to adjourn. Uh, this is, this slide, this the first one or second one? Show the second slide. Okay, this slide went out to 30. The second one goes out to 35. And this is the second one, it goes out to 35, and uh, it peaks out not at 106 million barrels a day, but at 96 million barrels a day. So in just two years, they lowered their expectations. I want to note, Mr. Chairman, that four and a half years ago, I led a CODEL to China to talk about energy. Nine of us went to China to talk about energy. And I was stunned when they began their discussion of energy by talking about post-oil. Of course there will be a post-oil world. By the way, the first person that I know to recognize that was Hyman Rickover, the father of our nuclear submarine, who gave a fantastic talk the 15th day of May, I think it was, 1957, in St. Paul, Minnesota, to a group of physicians. And he noted then that in the 8,000-year recorded history of man, the age of oil would be but a blip. And he called this this golden age. He had no idea how long the golden age would last. But he said how long it lasted was important in only one regard. The longer it lasted, the more time would we have to plan an orderly transition to other sources of energy. Of course, we've done none of that, and now we're up against a real crisis here. I love crises, by the way, because they challenge you, so I'm exhilarated by this. But this is a huge challenge, and I think that if our government starts, starts to being honest with the American people, you know, the, the, the Chinese talked about post-oil. Of course there will be a post-oil world. They think in terms of, of, of decades and generations. We think in terms, you know, do anything you have to get yourself elected two years from now, then you'll start to be responsible. And our corporate people look at the next quarterly report. That's got to look good or hell is going to break loose. So, you know, I'll do anything I have to to make that break look good. Who is looking down the road in our country? I know ARPA-E is, thank you. But, you know, somebody else needs to be looking down the road, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Barlin. Thank you for, the, for your patience here. Uh, I will uh, thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Now, I hate to make an addition here, but given the fact that I still am waiting for answers to my letter from, from months ago, I'm going to ask you to be timely if you can. I'm going to ask each of you to commit to me that you'll be timely in this so it can be included in the record. Do I have... You have my commitments. You have my you have commitment. And, and commitment. I'm going to say Dr. M because I'm not going to pronounce his <laughs> name anymore. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are excused. The hearing is adjourned.